Welcome to MoneyWeb at Midday, the actuality news show, offering unique insights and in-depth analysis, featuring South Africa's top business leaders, newsmakers, and analysts for today's professionals. Your host, Jeremy Mads. Hello and welcome to MoneyWeb at Midday. I'm Jeremy Maggs and over the next 30 minutes I'll bring you the latest headlines from South Africa and around the globe. Whether you're tuning in live or catching the podcast later, please stay with us for in-depth conversation with leading business minds, political influencers and key newsmakers. It is everything you need to stay informed. Quick, sharp and straight to the point. It's Wednesday, the 30th of October. On our program today, could independent power producers help offset ESCOM's proposed 36% tariff hike? How Black Friday sales will impact the South African economy? Why an expert says government and the private sector should get more kudos for the work they've been doing in curbing the spread of animal disease? And Zelda Lakhranji on the biggest lessons she learnt from Madiba. With rising electricity costs and the strain of load shedding, South Africans have been seeking any sign of relief when it comes to their power bills. Now, there has been a positive development on this front. New price trends and improvements in grid infrastructure may offer a little bit of a financial breather for grid power users in the country. And today I want to unpack what this means for consumers and the broader future of South Africa's energy landscape. Roy Haverman is with us, consulting economist at the Bureau for Economic Research. And first of all, then, Roy, can you explain the improvement? Oh, well, there's been a number of developments, I think, from the industry side in terms of an improved uh, model for financing of grid infrastructure. As we know, um, the big constraint at the moment is the lack of sufficient grid infrastructure for the new um, renewable energy plants that are coming online. And uh, we're looking, hoping that there will be announcements from the Treasury on uh, how infrastructure grid will be financed. In addition, Eskim has also made a number of progress in terms of unlocking more grid availability by um, better optimization of the grid. So what is driving this then? What are the main reasons for the drop in grid power costs? In grid power costs? Mm. Yes, well, um, the grid is, as you know, has been severely constrained. So um, the uh, drop in the grid power costs has been mainly as a result of uh, a number of factors, including uh, improved financing conditions. Um, the Obviously, the ESCOM has substantially improved its energy availability factor as a result of a number of initiatives that it's undertaken over the last year, um, which has put more electricity onto the grid, um, that has helped stabilize the grid, and that has overall, I think, led to a substantially improved situation for the grid. And Roy, are these uh, regional, or are there regional differences in cost reduction or is this now a national trend, which I guess would be welcomed? Yes, well, the grid, as you know, is quite regionalized in terms of uh, different capacities in different parts of the grid. So one of the issues has been the grid capacity has been very constrained in the Western Cape Um and in the Northern Cape, because most of the new um, electricity has been put online in the Northern Cape. And so the regional dynamics have been quite important. And it is a general trend overall. Um, but, you know, overall, it doesn't really matter if it is regional or, or national. Um, the impact will be felt throughout the country, because if you can unlock grid capacity in certain parts of the country, then you can utilize that capacity elsewhere. So obviously, then we have a new price paradigm here. How is this affecting, or is it too early to say, the average South African household's monthly power bill? Um, It's too early to say. The long term implications, I think, will be quite significant, um, particularly in terms of um, bringing about, you know, more effective um, pricing of, of different parts of electricity uh, infrastructure. So um, one of the big impacts of allowing for new generation at the generation part has been for the cost of generation to come down. As we know, renewables can cost up to 25% less than coal. Then um, the other parts of the of the infrastructure have been the grid and then uh, at the municipal level, which is distribution. 
And so overall, if we can get the prices to more accurately reflect the costs of those pieces of infrastructure, then we can more accurately get to a point where we can finance the different parts of the grid in the, the whole electricity value chain. And that will, in the long run, bring about a situation where um, electricity is priced appropriately and priced appropriately at the different points in the cycle, which will allow us to make sure that we can invest in the right parts of the system. And obviously, as I said, grid infrastructure investment is very important. So I might beg the question then how this could change or impact consumer interest in alternative power sources like solar, given that uh, so many individuals and businesses have opted for that path anyway, almost driven by desperation. Yes, well, the interesting thing is, obviously, we've seen, you know, as you know, the NERSA figures have brought out that there's about six gigawatts of new energy that has been brought onto the grid. And consumers are, are, are doing this at home, but those are usually the wealthier consumers because they have the ability to either pay for that additional um, self-generation themselves or they can borrow. And the the consequence is that actually poorer households are not really getting the, the, the benefits of that. And I think that if we can get to a system where it's more accurately priced and the prices are correct for the grid infrastructure, then that will benefit actually all consumers, but particularly poorer consumers. What I'm also interested to get your view on is if we're seeing over time a price drop, particularly in the business sector that has been reliant on, uh, particularly heavy industry that's reliant on power, surely this has a positive knock-on effect when it comes to inflation, and therefore it could signal an improvement in growth down the line. Absolutely. So electricity is a very large component of uh, consumer pr- the consumer price index, and it's a component both directly. So obviously, because um, businesses you know use electricity as part of um, making goods, it goes directly into consumer prices, but also indirectly because those prices are then passed along throughout the chain. So and there's second round effects of high energy prices. So it's an obvious point that. If energy prices can come down, then um, overall consumer prices will come down. That will allow give the central bank some space to cut interest rates. It will bring down the cost of capital for everybody and be very positive, I think, for growth. All right. So improvement in grid infrastructure. But having said that, though, Roy, where do you see the short and medium term risk still existing? Well, grid infrastructure takes a long time to um, build. So um, it is also quite complex in the sense that you have to often um, use, um, you know, it has to be over long distances, you have to get um, rights to to build it over long distances. One of the technicalities is that there is a bit of a uh, a global demand for grid and so uh, getting hold of the actual um, wires has been quite difficult. Um, but over the long term, this is very positive in terms of getting us to a point where um, we can bring on more renewable energy uh, in the medium and long run. Because if we can relax the grid constraint, then I think it will be positive for everybody. So is there any advice then that you could either give to businesses or consumers looking to make informed decisions about uh, power usage in the Ford? Uh, going forward and managing their energy bills effectively? Well, I think the fundamental problem is that South Africa is a very um, high, very energy intensive country anyway, um, even before load shedding. So that's the first point is that we do use a lot of energy generally and that I think businesses have become a lot better at reducing their energy consumption, but they should continue doing that. Um, The second piece of advice is that... um, the um, managing, you know, one doesn't want to to make people sort of feel that suddenly the load shedding has disappeared forever and that all these constraints are magically lifting. You know, as economic growth continues, there there will definitely continue to be some energy constraints. So basically, we're not quite out of the woods yet. Um, so I think the overall message would be to continue to manage your energy use as sustainably and carefully as possible. I'm going to leave it there. Roy Haverman, thank you very much indeed. Consulting economist at the Bureau for Economic Research. MoneyWeb at Midday for all your up-to-date stories.
As South Africa's Black Friday shopping season is set to inject an estimated 88 billion rand into the economy, retailers are now gearing up for a real surge in demand. And today we're joined by Gerard LaRue from Capital Connect to discuss how retailers can strategically prepare, optimize funding and harness Black Friday's potential to drive growth. So let's dive into the role of short-term business funding and what lies ahead then for South African retailers this season. And Gerard, firstly then, what trends are driving the increased consumer interest come Black Friday? It's interesting, Jeremy. I think, uh, firstly, I think there's a lot of positivity and that's probably got to do with a combination of the Springbok, Strikers and maybe some Czechish 6060 ideas and concepts along the way. But if we look at the study that we conducted through the Bureau of Market Research, compared to previous years, there's a 51% higher consumer interest. Now, that data obviously is very exciting news for the retailers because at the end of the day, there's probably about 136 billion rand of additional revenue that's going to be generated through this period. And like you said, it's not just a day or a week. Mm. It's actually technically two months because Black Friday is the springboard for the festive season. So if retailers can capitalize on this two-month period during the year, they can potentially unlock additional profits um, that can see them through the tough January, February months of, of next year. Let's talk about those strategies in just a moment. But I would also imagine that, uh, you know, apart from the box and, and, and drikas, uh, factors like inflation, which seems to be coming under some semblance of control, and even potentially another interest rate cut is going to have a positive impact on retail spending. And let's also, Gerard, not forget lots of people with a lot of two-pot cash in their back pocket. And that's for sure. And I I think that GNU also has a role to play here. There's a lot of optimism around that. And that's increasing the consumer um, positivity all around. And that's leading to them going above and beyond. And and an interesting statistic that we also uncovered through this research is that online only sales only account for about 6% of total sales. And that's a very interesting statistic to look at because most people believe that their online component of their shopping is becoming the predominant way of doing things. Mm. But what's slowly but surely starting to take over is what we call click and collect. There's a huge number of consumers that prefers buying online but then going to the store to actually pick up that item and see what else is there. And in-store, what we call shop attainment, is also a very important factor for these general dealers to focus on. You want to make sure that that consumer is wowed when they go through that experience so that they can come back to your store, increase their basket size, which means the the spend in store is starting to to increase as well. So, Gerard, if we push the click and collect concept, do you think that preferences are then shifting in terms of the type of product that uh, is purchased during this particular time? Interestingly enough, if we look at the, the data through this Bureau of Market Research that we've done, Uh, The five categories that's going to win on the top is still groceries, like your fresh produce, meat, dairy, beverages, etc. Secondly, it's clothing. And then only third and fourth, it's your appliances and your electronics. Now, usually during Black Friday, consumers are looking towards those big ticket items to get some good discounts. But although there's positive sentiment all around, I think most consumers are still looking at their budget very closely and bulking up on some of these grocery items that's going to see them through the November and even December period is probably going to be the first choice um, when they start um, planning that budget. I'd like your view on this as well. On the one hand, retailers have got a very short window period to create urgency and to boost sales over this time. But on the flip side of that, uh, there is a risk attached to overly heavy discounting. Yes, yes and no. We've also uncovered that a lot of retailers has a wait and see mentality this year around. So you know that load shedding is obviously not that frequent anymore, but you're still unsure and you're waiting and seeing, but you can't miss out on the opportunity. If you are waiting and seeing, that means you are standing still. And in today's economy, if you are standing still as a retailer, you are busy dying. You need to make informed decisions. And yes, you can't just buy any opportunity that's around you. You need to know who's your target audience, become customer centric, but then capitalize on that. And having access to short term opportunity capital is a perfect way of uh, capitalizing on this period. And I would like to encourage retailers that do see some profits during this November and December period to make sure that they reinvest that back into the business for next year. Look at diversifying, look at adding additional profit centers within your your business. Make sure that these profits are going to good use for for next year's um, revenue chasing as well. 
is one of the strategies that retailers either employ or should be employing is to make a, a choice of three or four select items which are going to hook people either online or into the store, heavily discount that, and then once you've got them in the store, you've hooked them. For sure. And the click and collect concept is not necessarily buying online and collecting physically in the mm-hmm. store. The click and collect also refers to seeing online specials that's going to pique the consumer interest and that's going to get them to the physical store to buy that OMO that's on special as an example. But once you are there, you've probably received some bonuses uh, or uh, increase in your salary with with all of the interest rate cuts and, and the positivity that's going all around. Now you start to see other items in store that you then put into your basket. So yes, the big ticket items, the specials, that's going to get consumers to the store, but then it becomes the retailer's uh, prerogative to start being extremely creative with their marketing in store to make sure that that spend increases while the consumer has has their attention. And part of that, Gerard, is to make sure that uh, you can rise above the media noise over a certain period of time, given that everyone is doing the same thing. How do you strategize around that? Again, being customer centric, something as uh, like a loyalty program where you've got very valuable insights about your typical shopper that's coming into your establishment. Um, You need to capitalize on that. Having access to the data is one thing. Using it to your advantage is a totally different thing. And one thing that retailer often overlooks during this period is also great customer service in store right through from the security guard greeting you at the main entrance to the cashier helping you, to somebody that's seeing that you are lost and you can't find the item you're looking for and just holding your hand and taking you to that item. That customer service can go a long way for repeat business in the future. Do you think that retailers, and I'm thinking more of the smaller operations perhaps, pay enough attention to realistic consumer data interpretation? Maybe on a, on a small scale, but they don't have access to that large scale data. And that's why these uh, studies that we conduct on a yearly basis, it is obviously for all retailers, but we've got a special place in our heart for the small SMEs. And they need to use this data to their advantage to capitalize on the data that's being presented to them. And who knows, this November and December period can give, give them some additional profits that's going to help them next year to expand and diversify. And they can also start growing into a medium-sized business as well. Gerard Leroux, thank you very much indeed from Capital Connect. Some very useful advice there for retailers. I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeremy. MoneyWeb at Midday for all your up-to-date stories. South Africa's agricultural sector has been facing mounting challenges with the spread of animal diseases, which pose significant risks to food security and economic stability. Recently, collaborative efforts between the government and the agriculture industry have made notable progress in controlling these outbreaks. And today, I want to look at how these efforts are shaping the future of animal health management in the country and what it means for farmers and consumers. Wandili Sihlobo is the chief economist of the Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa and joins me now. So first of all, Wandili, what are the main diseases that we're talking about and the impact then on the economy? Yeah, Jeremy, I think the first point perhaps maybe to to put forward is that the livestock and poultry is super important to South Africa's farming economy. If you think about the gross value added of agriculture, about half of our farming fortunes is really livestock and poultry. There's also further interlinkages because the the point is that in our annual consumption, say of maize, about half of it goes to gray, to, to to livestock and poultry. Uh, soybeans also goes there. So that means that whenever you face challenges in the poultry and the livestock industry, you tend to pretty much see all of that causing ripple effect across mm. the farming economy. In the past three years, we have experienced about three major diseases. One, foot and mouth in cattle, two, African swine fever in uh, pigs, and three, the avian influenza in our poultry industry. That's where the challenges have been. Is all of this just part of the natural agricultural cycle, or did the industry itself drop the ball somewhere in terms of prevention and control? 
I would say broadly, it is part of the agricultural cycle in a sense that these diseases are not unique to South Africa. You may recall that about three or four years ago, China struggled in their pig industry with their African swine fever. Uh, And we see in Europe, the avian influenza continuing to be an issue. But of course, there's always an element of ensuring that within the industry, farmer by farmer, everyone must ensure that the biosecurity controls are intact. Um, And we are all people, there could always be room for any error, but I would say, broadly looking at it, uh, this is a challenge that we see all over the world, but we need to intensify ways of saying, how do we control it? And the impact, of course, and we'll get to control mechanisms in just a moment, but the impact, of course, always is on food security. And in that respect, South Africa is always on a knife edge here. South Africa is always on a knife edge, uh, Jeremy. You you will recall that uh, we embarked about two or three years ago on a strategy where we were saying as a sector, we want to be export led, which is really something that has assisted in our growth over the past uh, three decades. But in a beef industry specific, it's only in the past three to four years where we're saying we are focusing on exports. Now, if you have these animal disease outbreaks, you tend to have your products banned uh, in terms of trade which is exactly what we saw in some of the beef market in in various markets, uh, which is why if you had to look at our 2022 beef exports, they were down double digit. It is only in 2023 where we started to see a modest recovery and indeed even wool industry. Wool industry is very important for the farming economy of the Eastern Cape, particularly the Transkei region where there's still a lot of smallholder farmers that aggregate wool and about 70 percent of our wool is exported to china and china at some point in 2022 put a temporary ban in our wool export and that also had a massive impact 22 percent or so in value terms decline in our wool exports um into into china so those are all of the difficulties that we, we have faced which is why biosecurity is important there and of course then it has an element of food security as well because when the farming towns and the farming economy is not doing well well, you tend to see that in the vibrancy of these regions. So how successful has this uh, government uh, industry stakeholder collaborative approach been? I think we have been uh, quite successful. At the end of last week, the Department of Agriculture issued a formal statement saying, look, we have been cleared in a number of provinces and even at the international level, the bodies that regulate this, they are saying, OK, we are happy with South Africa that you have made progress. And this is a commendable step, um, uh, Jeremy, because you will remember that in 2022, for the first time, six of our nine provinces had what we call foot and mouth disease, which was affecting the cattle industry. Now to have progress that we have made where only KZN and the Eastern Cape still struggle, that means that we can now continue in our ambition of growing the red meat export in various markets, but also China had put certain protocols to ensure that we can continue to export our wool, even if there is outbreak of foot and mouth in cattle and it's not affecting sheep. So in a way, we are starting to see a recovery. And I think that um, the, the Department of Agriculture working with industry, they just have to intensify that and even think about the vaccine manufacturing capabilities that needs to be improved domestically. Are you confident about the requisite improvement in vaccine availability and veterinary support? On a vaccine, uh, Jeremy, I'll I'll be honest with you that we we still struggle as a country. You may have read um, that the OBP, which used to be the country's golden child when it comes to vaccine production, has faced management challenges over time. And I am not fully, fully as confident that we are there yet. I know from conversation with the minister, with the director general, that they are working on ensuring as a department that it, 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 it recovers. But I think that will take some time. The same is true for the agricultural Research Council, the ARC. But I think what gives hope about the current moment is that the right conversation and the right potential investments are being put on the table to say, how do we begin uh, to boost our production uh, of the vaccines? In the past few months, we have relied on what we import from the likes of uh, Namibia and the others that have been assisting us. But I think as a country, we we do need uh, to intensify our efforts and revive because we do have the institutions. It's just that they, they felt under management challenges over the past few years. Do we need to intensify our adaptation and investment in technology when it comes to monitoring and managing animal health? 
hundred uh, percent on that, and I think that uh, intensifying the inv- investment in technology because that will assist us. Because my sense is, with climate change, some of these outbreaks are not going to go away. Uh, we are beginning, if you were to map up the outbreaks of the diseases in Europe, in Asia, and in South Africa, you will see that over the past three, four years, uh, there've been many of them that are coming up. So I do think that one, as farmers have to increase their capabilities on surveillance and control of the animals, uh, the state vets also need to do that part. And to your earlier point, we also need to invest more in hiring more state vets that are qualified uh, so they can gain experience and assist in this Mm. and also then utilizing the technology capabilities on the surveillance while at the same time investing as well on um, other ways of of boosting our vaccine but I think tech um, and research has to be at the heart of what we are doing and this is very important because livestock health is everything when you are thinking about the structure of the South African farming Mm. economy. One assumes that Big Agri in South Africa is playing successfully in the tech space, but I would be more concerned uh, surely about uh, small and medium sized enterprises, which in many respects are the backbone of the agricultural agricultural economy and whether they are adapting sufficiently. This is why, Jeremy, because you're raising a super important point here, and this is why we say uh, investment and revival of the OBP Uh, as well as the ARC, the Agricultural Research Council, is important because those are state-owned entities whose research output benefits everyone, not only those that have the financial muscle to go ahead. But also when you deal with the biologicals, there's certain vaccines that cannot be produced at a private sector level. Only the state has a super control over those. And some of the vaccines of dealing with some of the diseases that we have been talking about are those that only the state can really produce that. Uh, which then uh, could benefit everyone. But I think broadly, in terms of productivity, in terms of nutrition and everything else, um, we need to do more of some of that research also in the state uh, facilities so that the smallholder farmers uh, do benefit um, on that. And I think this underscores why Minister Stian Hayes and DG Ramasori of Agriculture, they have to ensure that uh, the ARC is back to its former glory days so that he can serve all of the farming uh, farmers in this country. One daily Seth Lobo, thank you very much indeed, Chief Economist of the Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa. You're listening to MoneyWeb at Midday. And finally, when a thoughtless tweet by Zelda Lekranji unleashed a storm, she was asked, have you learnt nothing from Nelson Mandela? Well, a new book called What Nelson Mandela Taught Me is the answer. For years, she was the closest witness of Mandela's interactions with people, both famous and ordinary. And in it, she draws out his lessons on humility, respect and honesty, and also how to listen, to truly listen. And what to do if you realize that you've made a mistake, a lesson she herself had to learn the hard way. It really is a new primer for anyone in business. And she joined me earlier on Fix SA right here on Money web the podcast drops on friday and this is an extract and zelda on a bigger canvas uh, you say that he also understood for the, that uh, for the country to avert civil war it was necessary to show compassion in order to forgive and move forward I mean, obviously that later came out in the hansi cronier story but you also say we hardly see this kind of empathy these days. And that's a real problem in uh, the kind of doggy dog world of not only politics in South Africa, uh, but also the hard nosed uh, way of business. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's that very simple ethos of putting yourself in someone else's shoes, you know, trying to understand their suffering and their battles. And very few of us, because of the fast pace also that we live in today, um, very few of us actually take the time to try and imagine that and show that kind of empathy and sympathy um, sometimes, you know, to people. So I think Madibo was particularly good at that, um, you know, showing people or taking um, hands with people, um, you know, as again, the opposition 
situation, trying to also put himself in their shoes and, and they are trying to imagine their fears and they trying to understand, you know, what they were facing. And that made him such a successful negotiator and because he had the ability to see things from all different sides. So I think that's something that we should pay a lot more attention to um, and it will make the world a much kinder place if we do so with a little bit um, compassion, a, a bit more compassion. Zelda, I'm going to mix my metaphor slightly here, but uh, in order to see everything from that uh, full 360 degrees that you reference, you also have to listen. So you're not only using your eyes, but your Ooh. ears as well. And you write about Mandela's approach to listening and why it is such an important skill in today's uh, divided uh, world, divided South Africa sometimes, divided communities. What did you learn about his approach to listening? Well, Jeremy, the first childhood memory that Nelson Mandela had was about learning the art of listening. He was as a young boy, and I detail it in um, what Nelson Mandela taught me. Um, he, As a young boy, he was allowed in meetings of the elders in the tribe, in the Tembu tribe. Um, the sole purpose, what he witnessed there was the sole purpose of the leader of the meeting was to listen to all the submissions made um, around the table. So um, the, the leader was only listening and, and then at the end, the leader gave a summary of all the inputs that were given, not his own opinion. And that, for me, had an unquestionable influence on Nelson Mandela's own ability to listen. He listened to people with the intention of understanding them and not with the intention of always responding. And I think with instant gratification and smartphones today, we listen to respond because there's this very unhealthy um, environment that we live in that you have to be the smartest or you have to have most likes or the most most popular uh, social media post, whereas we then lose the ability to really listen to understand. So for me, that was something that they practice also every single day. And sometimes, you know, we would just look at you while you give your submission. And at the end, he would just say to you, um, oh, yeah, very well, I see. And that meant that in that moment, he saw you and he observed you completely. But it didn't mean that he necessarily agreed with you. So I think, you know, that's also something that leaders should be able to do is just to listen to people and really pay attention to uh, body language and all the things that come with it, you know, but really listening with the intention to understand where the other point is coming from. The book is called What Nelson Mandela Taught Me, Timeless Lessons from Leadership and Life. The author is the well-known Zelda Lekranji and the publisher is Tafelberg. And that is our program for today. MoneyWeb at Midday is live at noon weekdays. We're then up as a podcast. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Listen to the daily live stream of MoneyWeb at midday or download episodes on moneyweb.co.za, the MoneyWeb app, Apple Podcasts and Spotify or follow MoneyWeb News on social media for more updates. MoneyWeb, your trusted source for business and investment insights.